Are you looking for information on flying internationally with your dog in cargo? Is your dog too big to fly in the cabin? Then this video is for you. Welcome to Track Us Down. If you're just finding us, I'm Monique. And I'm Doug. After over 25 years of working hard and raising our family, we retired from our careers, we sold everything, and we began our second half of life. We begin here on the beautiful island of Madeira. So welcome to part two of our two video series on traveling internationally by plane with a dog in cargo. If you haven't seen our first video, we'll link it down below. Part one, it's very important for the steps that are required leading up to this part of actually flying with your dog. So in part one, we covered everything you need to consider right through to booking your flight, as well as how to purchase the appropriate crate and how to crate train a dog who has never been crate trained before. In this video, we're gonna go one step further and cover the last steps that you need to bring your dog successfully across the ocean, internationally, or to Europe. We are gonna talk about developing a pet passport for your dog, the travel prep that needs to happen, travel day, what to expect, and arriving in Europe. Let's begin. So your dog is healthy enough to travel. Your dog is the type of breed that is allowed to travel. You've booked your flights. You've booked your dog in cargo. You've bought your crate. You've trained your dog to be able to spend at least eight or nine hours in a crate. Now it's time to go. So the first thing your dog will need is the microchip installed. So along with the crate training, three or four months ahead, you've already thought if your dog is healthy enough, but you do need to visit the vet. If your dog does not have a microchip, that is something that needs to happen early. So one of the requirements for entering most European countries that I've researched, and in particular Portugal, was to have a microchip. The microchip does need to be ISO compliant. It's a 15 digit microchip. It is the one that's most commonly used. If your dog has a microchip that is not ISO compliant, you can still come into Europe with that dog. You do need to carry your own microchip reader. So I don't think we've seen many people do that. And from my research, most people have the microchip that is compliant. Our dog did not have a microchip at that time. So we did have to do this early. The next thing that you need to be sure that your dog has is rabies vaccination. Many dogs already have this vaccination. Leo already had the vaccination, so we didn't need to redo it. But if your dog does not have a current rabies vaccination, that is something you need to do. And that also needs to be done at least, I think, 21 days out, but months ahead is always best. The next thing that needs to happen before you start compiling your pet passport is to visit your veterinarian. It needs to be a certified veterinarian or an accredited veterinarian, depending on the country you're coming from. You would need to check with whatever body of government is responsible for import and export of animals. In Canada, for example, that is the CFIA. In the United States, it is the USDA. So there is specific paperwork that you need to download for the country that you are entering. In the case of Portugal, you would go on the Portuguese Animals into Portugal website and you would simply download the paperwork. It comes in Portuguese and in English and that is the paperwork that needs to be completed by your veterinarian and submitted to either the USDA or CFIA and returned to you for you to arrive in Europe with what they call the health certificate. What it says on the health certificate in particular is non-commercial movement of five or less dogs, cats, or ferrets. So in this case, of course, we're talking about dogs. Your veterinarian will need to complete that paperwork, send it to the CFIA or USDA. They will need to stamp its approval and return it to you. That all needs to happen within the last 10 days before leaving on your flight. So it's a good idea to have two vet appointments booked. One well out of that to ensure that you have the paperwork for rabies and microchip and one within those 10 days so that you can get that final health check completed. The vet can fill out the paperwork necessary. It has time to go to the USDA or CFIA or whatever governing body in your country looks after that get stamped for approval and returned to you so that you have it on travel day. 
there is a small fee usually involved in that process as well. So just on that note, with the chief vet, we'll call it, who makes that final stamp, that is different than your normal vet. That is different. That is someone who represents either the USDA or the CFIA who reviews the document and signs off on it and puts an embossed symbol. So they may or may not be in your community. You will have to look into where that particular body is in relation to where you live. And I know, Monique, when you were setting this all up, you actually had a visit with that head person ahead of time just to make sure everything went smoothly when you actually needed that stamp. So in my research, sometimes you are able to take the paperwork yourself and go in and have this done. In other cases, when I've talked to other people, they did have to send in the paperwork. Apparently some vets can do it online and send that in and then it's returned in a self-addressed envelope. But in some cases, you might actually just be able to do that yourself, which was our case, which was really nice to have that in hand. Cause I know 10 days is a really short time frame. So now that your pet has a microchip and the rabies vaccination has been done and you've done a health check with your vet, you're ready to start putting together what we're going to call the pet passport. Here in Europe, there actually is an official pet passport that you can obtain for your pet. Back in North America, whether that be the US or Canada, there is not an official pet passport. But for travel purposes, it's nice to have all the information together and all that information together does make what we call a pet passport. So here are some things that you can put in this order that would be a pet passport. Number one, begin with a picture of your pet, the name of your country and a flag of your country. Then within the next pages, you will have the information that's necessary along with the matching documents that would be the rabies certificate and the microchip number. Number one will be details of ownership. That will have the name of the owners, their address and their phone numbers at both their country of origin and where they will be when they arrive in Europe. So you will need two addresses for the details of ownership portion. Number two, you will need to have both owners passport numbers on the document. Number three, you will need to write your itinerary in the pet passport. This, this pet passport is going to be traveling on top of the crate and, and a copy along with you. If anything should happen to the crate, this is where they will see what your itinerary is and where the dog should be. So it will list all the flight numbers, all the times and the destinations in this portion of the pet passport. Number four will be a description of the animal. So it will contain the animal's name, the species, the breed, the gender, the color and the animal's birth date. And number five, the official vet details along with the two pages of the animal's photos and this information, you will include a copy of a recent health check. You will include a copy of the rabies certificate. You will include a copy of the microchip number along with the entry health certificate that you downloaded from whatever country you're entering that will be attached here as well. All this together comprises the pet passport. What you need to do then is make a copy for yourself and put one copy in a sealed plastic envelope and attach that to the top of the crate on travel day. That way the, your pet will have his pet passport attached to the crate and you will also have a copy of the pet passport on your person. Step two is travel prep. Specifically, we're talking about the crate, the hotel and contacting the country of origin that you're coming in with your dog. So for the crate, you want to make sure that you have the metal hardware on and everything's fastened. You have the live animal stickers on. You have your pet passport ready. And we had ours in a plastic folder like this with the zippers closed and it was taped on top, properly labeled. And we had Leo's pet passport in there with all the information for his flight, where he was going, where he was coming from, our information so that we could be found in case he was separated from us. As well, we had one meal's worth of kibble of his food in a Ziploc bag that was taped on top of his crate in case there was any kind of delay that he needed to be fed, he had food. And on the front of his crate, on the cage door, we created a 
watering tube out of a rubber hose that bent down into his crate and went into one of his two trays that came with his crate. So if anybody wanted to come by and give him water, they could pour some water in that tube and it would go into his, uh, into his dish. I don't know if anybody ever used that. They might have without <laughs> us knowing, but during the travels, maybe in a little bit of state of anxiety, he chewed the end off that tube anyways. So he had some fun with that. And, and the food was still there. And you often see they recommend freezing some ice in the little water tray, so that's another option that you can do. Now, as far as the hotel, this is something that we didn't mention before, but it is very important. Months ahead of time, as you're booking your flights, you also wanna make sure that you're booking direct flights, and if there are multiple lakes to your journey, to have a night or two, depending on the length of the flight you just had, in between your flights. So your, has, your dog has time to rest, to relax, and to decompress. So you have to make sure that the hotel that you have booked is dog friendly. There is one, for example, that we booked originally and we didn't realize until after that it wasn't dog friendly and we had to switch to a different one. You have to do some research, depending on your stopovers and your final destination, to make sure that the hotel that you're stopping over in is actually dog friendly. And last but not least, at least 48 hours ahead of time, you need to contact the country you're going to. These numbers are often given to you by the airline or you can call the airport directly and they will give you a website. I think you can even look up most of them online and they will give you a website where you send in the information about your pet along with the health certificate and a short note saying this is the date of our arrival and the time. That way they ensure that there is a vet there in the airport to meet you when you arrive. Because when you arrive, your pet will be checked and if they already have the information and have reviewed it, the process goes much smoother. We'll talk about that when we talk about arriving in Europe. That's right, so you sent that information by email. That's right. As far as the pet passport. And when we got to Lisbon and you go to the area where you pick up your dog, there's a vet station there and they already have that information. It made it a lot easier. So travel day is here. Your dog is ready, you're ready, your bags are packed. You make your way to the airport. What happens next? You might have thought that I'll give my dog a sedative. He'll be nice and relaxed for the flight. That can't happen. The vets that we talk to, they, and even on the airlines, they say do not give your dog any kind of sedative as it could cause a cardiac arrest or some kind of health implications for your dog. So don't think that you're gonna give your dog any kind of sedative or relaxant. It's not good for your dog at the altitude that they'll be flying. And as we mentioned before, if your dog is comfortable in their crate, that should be sufficient. There are some sprays that you can buy that are relaxing kind of sprays that are helpful maybe to spray in the crate or spray on your dog for help for Fair relaxation. Pheromones. Right. Right. And, and those ones are okay. Those don't count as medication. So what is travel day like with a dog? The first thing you need to know is that when you have a giant crate with you, you stand out like a sore thumb and Moving around an airport, if you're the kind of traveler who's used to being quick and sort of pulling your one little case, that's not the case anymore. You're those big bulky travelers. One person has the crate on one of the push carts, the other person has all the luggage. It's kind of messy. <laughs> so be prepared for that. It really is a two person job. I can't imagine having my luggage and the crate by myself and looking after all the dog stuff as well. So it is really a two person job. So expect that you're going to be slow. It's going to be bulky. It's not like just traveling with two people. For the dog, as Doug mentioned earlier, have some food attached on the top just in case. Our food didn't get touched and that was okay, but have it there just in case. Make sure you feed your dog three to four hours before the flight, a nice light meal and have some water. Right before you enter the airport, your dog is gonna need to be in the crate. So you wanna take the dog for a nice long walk, make sure he goes to the washroom, make sure he gets some exercise before entering the crate. Yeah, we did a lot of walking around different airports. I've seen more of airport grounds that I've never walked on before. <laughs> For sure. And most airports, do your research before, have a pet relief area, not the one inside for the small little dogs that get to travel on the plane, but there usually is one outside as well and they're usually quite nice. There's a place for the dogs to go to the washroom, they usually have some waste disposal bags, they have a place to sit and a place for the dogs to run. So try and use those ahead of time 
before you even get into the airport. Once you're in the airport and you go up to check in, your dog will have a ticket, just as you do, and they will direct you usually to the oversized baggage area where your dog will be put with the cargo. That is the goodbye point. And for me, that was the hardest part of the travel, was the first time we said goodbye to him at the oversized baggage. What you need to remember here is what Caesar Milan talks about, about leaving the animal in a calm state. So there is no heartfelt goodbyes. It's very businesslike and calm and have a good flight. We'll see you when we get there and you walk away. We did this with Leo and I think it made a big difference that he knew we were calm, he was calm, and that was our goodbye for the first leg of our journey. When we arrived after our first flight, we went and picked up Leo. We went outside immediately, got him out of the crate. No big hoopla, just he comes out, you give a treat, you make sure you're in one of the pet relief areas, he goes for a run, and then we spent the night uh, at a pet friendly hotel nearby where we walked, we ate meals at regular times, and we prepared for the next day's travel. And now you're ready for the next leg of your journey, and you're basically repeating what happened the first time. You're arriving early to the airport, you're making sure that your dog has eaten a light meal well before, you're going for as many walks as you can outside, you're finding those pet relief areas outside, and you're leaving the dog in a calm manner before going on the plane. And I just want to add to one thing that Monique said, very important, is arrive as early as you can at the airport before your flight. You might have large suitcases with you, you have a large crate and a live animal in that crate, and whatever else you're bringing with you, and you have these steps to go through where you check in, then you go to oversized baggage, there is often you know, only one or two people working at the check-in, and it does take a long time to get even just checked in yourself you have to tell me of this dog, you show them the documentation so they allow your dog in, then you have to go to oversized baggage and turn your dog over. It takes a lot longer than just a regular check-in, so give yourself plenty of time. So now you're on board. Maybe you're having a drink, but you're more relaxed than when you left your dog anyways. On at least two of our segments of our flights, by the time we got on board and got to our seat, there was already a little tag on our seat saying, your pet is aboard, which really comforted us. Or we just asked the flight attendant. One of those segments, we just asked the flight attendant, they went and checked and they confirmed to us that our pet was aboard. And that made us feel pretty good. Often when you do research, you'll see that they often recommend to let the captain know that there is a pet in cargo, that they set the temperatures differently. Every time I did that, and I did do that, they said, oh, of course, of course. So they already had several pets aboard the flight. So now you have arrived in Europe. You have called ahead of time, emailed what needed to be emailed, done all that work, they know you're coming, and you're arriving with your pet at your destination. When you get off the airplane, you will once again go to the oversized baggage, and sometimes somewhere else they will direct you. I well, think we, we went to Lost and Found one time. We found Leo at Lost and Found in one of the airports. But that is where they moved the oversized baggage to Lost and Found. He wasn't the only pet there but you will find it and then you will look around and you will see where there is a veterinarian and there is one i guess i've been in airports so many times and i've never noticed that there is a little corner where they do have a veterinarian we arrived there and we said who we were and he said yes i got your paperwork and he met leo and he did the microchip check we paid a small fee and they gave us a little ticket that we needed to get out of the airport with Leo. There's no quarantine for dogs, not here in Portugal anyways, and as long as they have the healthcare certificate and all the relevant information, you walk out of the airport with your dog. And again, like Caesar Milan says, you remain calm, you open the crate, you take him for a small walk, and you begin life as normal. And I just want to say when you do meet the vet and he does his checks and everything's okay and that small fee, it is paid in cash. So we had euros with us. It's very important to have that because there was no card paying there. And when it's two in the morning and you're tired, if you don't have cash, maybe you can find an ATM nearby, but it's better to have the euros with you to pay the vet right then and there. And I think it was about 30 or 40 euros. About. 30 euros, I think, yeah. yeah. Here's a summary of all the points that we covered in this video, part two of our series on traveling internationally by plane with a big dog in cargo.
We did put some links down below, so if you're looking for something, it might be linked down below. But honestly, an easy Google research will let you know everything that you need to know about whatever country you are traveling to and whatever specific dog that you have. We had a pretty great experience mm -hmm. traveling internationally with our dog. We are not experts by any means, but we're no longer super fearful like we began. So we hope that this was helpful for you. There's loads of videos and loads of information available. It is on you then to pull together and find what's relevant to your case. We hope that you enjoyed our video. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. It really helps our little channel grow. And as always, check back in and... Track us down.